like to take the time to welcome you all and to welcome, we have a number of visitors with us. Um, I can see Brother Courtney's mom, Sister Pansy, welcome, good to have you. And then um, Bridget's relatives there, Denise and Shanice, welcome. I think there are some other people, persons here. I see some young folks. I didn't get their names. Um, sitting beside that, Denise, Denisha. Your niece and nephew. And what are their names? Welcome. We're good. Good to have you. And you know, before I even go further, we <laughs> uh, some of you got this last time, but. Um, I'd just like to tell you all that I love you. Yes, I was reminded by someone that we don't always tell one another how much we love each other. And um, honestly, truly, I really do appreciate having you as my family. Um, I know sometimes we come here and we'll uh, preach and maybe what I might have to say might sound like uh, 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 scolding sometimes. <laughs> Other times, you know, there's a mixture of the encouragement and hopefully always, hopefully always there's encouragement because I, I guess even like parents, sometimes parents may have to quote unquote discipline their children, but it should always be done in love, never meant to hurt nor to harm us. And I always remember that scripture, Jeremiah 29 and verse 11, where Christ says, he knows the plans he has for us. It's not plan to, it's plans to hurt nor to harm us, but rather to do what? To give us a hope and a future or an expected end. So I'd just like to let you know, let it be on record that I, I love you all and I thank you for loving me. And I, I know I'm loved. <laughs> um, you know, and I'm so appreciative of the, the, the love of the brethren, their prayers in particular. Um, you know, I've been through times when I really needed those prayers and I know that people offered up those prayers and God heard them. And that's what we are here for, to be there for one another, to encourage one another, to uplift one another, and to serve one another. So we're going to continue um, the series on Ephesians. Last week we stopped, we, we, we were in chapter 2 and we stopped at, uh, I think we stopped at verse 10. Uh, so we looked at that our position in Christ, uh, how and the riches that we have as as children of God, uh, spiritual and even physical riches too. Uh, we looked at the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and what that meant for us as believers. The fact that Christ sacrificed His life, and without that sacrifice, we would have no hope. Our li lives would really be pointless. So we're going to continue now in chapter 2, and in this section we're looking at this, the, the latter part of chapter 2 from verse 11 through to the end. Uh, Paul here focuses in this letter to the Ephesians on a unity or oneness in the body of Christ. And this unity is brought about not by human effort, yes we have to do something, yes, but the, the basis of that unity is actually what Christ has done. Uh, the, 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 his sacrifice, uh, bringing, bringing about that unity of you know, taking us from different backgrounds, from different ethnicities, from different uh, countries, from different places, from different walks in life. And through his sacrifice, or us accepting that sacrifice, we become one in Christ. You know, as I was preparing this, um, I, I reflected on the world in which we live. And my mind went back to the beginning, to the, the beginning of the book, the book of Genesis, the beginning of man's history. And we see that there's something that is that has characterized the history of the human race. And that is, it seems like there's always been this problem of division. It started in the Garden of Eden. Here, God created our four parents, Adam and Eve. And his intention, yes, to make them in his likeness and his image, that they would become like him. 
eventually to get to that stage where they would go through this life and develop that character to be like God himself. A oneness in the relationship, becoming one with God. But what happened? We know. There's an adversary. That old serpent entered the picture and sowed the seed of division, breaking the relationship, planting divisive thoughts, antagonistic thoughts in the minds of our four parents, Adam and Eve. And we know what that, that did. Sin started there. There's and the human race. And then it continued down through their children, Cain and Abel. So that Cain, the brother, rose up against his brother Abel and eventually killed him. And this has continued throughout human history. We see it, this picture, this, this, this cause of division between man and his maker. And, and it has just continued right through. We see it all around us. Division between races, or maybe if you want to, I guess more accurately, as was pointed out earlier, different ethnic groups, blacks against whites. And if that is not enough, people fight against one another, one country against another. And if that is not enough, regions within countries, different tribes and tribal warfare. That is not enough, we see fighting and divisions between the sexes, man against woman, male against female. And it just continues on and on. People divide themselves along socioeconomic lines. Okay, so you live in this part of the city, and somehow you're, where you live, houses are a little bit more pricey and prettier. So I live on the other side of town. Somehow that makes the ones who live up here seem to think that they are better than the ones who live down here. And it just continues on and on, this constant division. And it doesn't stop in the world around us. We have it even within the body of Christ. The place where it should not be is also the place where we do find it. Divisions among believers. Same set of people who call up on this one God. We call up on this one God as our God. And yet, we find reasons, we find causes to separate ourselves or to divide ourselves. Because, okay, so you believe certain things and I don't believe the other things and so. And within even congregations, churches like this, we still have that. Because you read the scriptures and you come to a certain understanding of something. I read the same scriptures and I have a different understanding. So, the enemy takes opportunity to use that to rip us apart. When there should, it should actually be unity, love and unity within the body of Christ. So let's get to Ephesians chapter 2. And I'll just... Um, what I'll do, just to set the pace, we'll just read from those verses where we left off last time. we just read right through to the end, and then I'll come back and um, start to get into it some more. So Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 11. Therefore, remember that you who were once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been made, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, 
and has broken down the middle wall of division between us. Yes, brethren, that's what Christ did. He came to break down that middle wall of division, of partition between us. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. And that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. Verse 17. And he came and he preached peace to you who were afar off, and to those who are near. For through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Verse 19, now therefore, as a result of all of this, now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but rather you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom, that is in Christ, in whom the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a habitation of God in the Spirit. A beautiful description, an idealistic description, but yet it is an attainable description of what the church of God should be. Let's go back to where I started here in verse 11. Paul writes here, he says, Therefore, remember that you who were once Gentiles in the flesh, and the ones who are called uncircumcision by that which is called a circumcision made in the flesh by hands. Who is Paul talking about here? He's talking about two groups of people. Gentiles, otherwise called the uncircumcision, and those who are called the circumcision. Let's look a little bit at this word Gentiles. Because there's a lot of debate, a lot of arguments, about what this means and who are Gentiles. Uh, the, ge the word Gentiles, uh, as used in the Greek, Strong's 1484, is ethnos. Ethnos. And it simply means, yes, Gentiles, nation, sometimes it's translated heathen, or just people. Gentiles, the uncircumcision, Paul writes here, you were once Gentiles or the uncircumcision. He says you were, you, were, you were separated from or you were strangers from those who are of the circumcision, who are called the circumcision. And how were they separated? How were Gentiles separated from the circumcision? And you might call the circumcision the Jews or the house of Israel those who had that covenant relationship. We see here, as we read down, it says that in verse 12, this is how they were separated, that in times past you were without Christ. The people were called Gentiles or the circumcision. It says that they were without Christ. They did not have that relationship without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. There are these five ways it, it shows here that they were separated. They were cut off from God. Gentiles were cut off from God without a savior. They were excluded from the covenant community. They were not a part of it. They didn't have that covenant relationship. And as such, they were not part of the promises that came with that covenant relationship. They were without God in the world. They were people living without hope. 
the hope which God gives to all those who believe and are called into the covenant relationship. They were without God. And for the most part, they worshipped idols. Such were the Gentiles, or such are the Gentiles. But then Paul says, it says that, verse 12, At that time, we read it again, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Remember last week we said, the Bible makes a lot of statements, but oftentimes it is followed by two words when one statement is made. Those two words, but God. Amen. But God. You who are once Gentiles, he says, but God, verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who are once afar off, you who are once a part of this covenant community, you who did not have this relationship with God and Christ, have now been brought near. How? By the sacrifice, by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that makes all the difference. That makes all the difference, brothers and sisters. It doesn't matter what you were. What matters is now what you are. Having been called, having been called into this relationship, having accepted that call, having committed one's life to follow Christ, coming into this covenant relationship. You are far off, but now you have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. For he himself is our peace. Well, I'm not, I mean, I'll get back to that later. As I reflect on this, I ask myself the question, is salvation only for the Jews? Is salvation only for the house of Israel? Is it? Okay. Some of you say no. But you know, there are some who would say yes, it's only for Israel. That Christ only came to save Israel or the house of Israel. I find it very hard to see through that. I find that very, very difficult to understand. Because when I read this Bible, I find several other places here that speaks completely opposite to such a belief. And so, Let's look a little bit deeper into this. You know, some would have you believe because you remember the incident with this Canaanite woman. Her daughter was demon possessed and she was tugging at Christ's garments. You know, come heal my daughter. She's demon possessed. She wanted Christ to have mercy and pity on her daughter. She was a Canaanite. She was not of the household of Israel. His disciples, what were they doing? Send this woman away. She's a disturbance. She's not even an Israelite. Clinging at the master's tail, at his garments. But what was Christ's response to that? He said something, and maybe, I don't know, maybe some people will take this to mean something quite different from what Christ intended. In Matthew 15 verse 24 he said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That is true. It's a statement of fact. But the fact that he said I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Is he anywhere saying here to this woman, I'm not here to serve you. Is he anywhere saying to her, was he anywhere saying to her, salvation is not for you, you're not an Israelite. 
He made a statement of fact. Yes, he was sent to the house of Israel. But you read so many other scriptures that show you that he came not just to save Israelites or the house of Israel. He came to call people from all different walks of life, many different tribes and tongues and nationalities, all different colors, all different shapes, all different sizes. He came to save humanity or various people from humanity at, 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 his first, at his first coming. I'd like us to look for a little bit in Revelation chapter 7. In Revelation chapter 7, it's talking about the, um, the, the coming of the Great Tribulation just before the return of Christ. And that a number of persons, God would offer them special protection. They would have a seal, the seal of God upon them that the wrath of God during that tribulation period would not come upon them. So we read in Revelation chapter 7, uh, verse uh, 5 through 8, Revelation chapter 7, verse 5 through 8, the author John uh, lists, it says there was 144,000, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. You know, for instance, it says from the tribe of Judah, 12,000, from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000, and so on and so forth. Then we come down to verse 9. After having listed these 144,000 from the house or the tribe of Israel, John writes, After these things, Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, the so-called innumerable multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, all nations, it's the same word, ethnos, ethnos, of all nations, of all nations, of all tribes, of all peoples, of all tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to who? Salvation belongs to our God. Not just the, it didn't say salvation belongs to the God of Israel only. Salvation belongs to our God, who, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. When I read that, what I'm seeing here is that, yes, God selected 144,000 from the tribe or the house of Israel, but he also granted favor, saving grace, to people from all different backgrounds who are not of the house of Israel. That's what, that's what I read here. Maybe some Persons may see otherwise, but that's what I see. Let's, 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 let's go into this a little bit further. I'm going to look at an example from the book of Acts. The example of a man called... Well, before I get there, just take this reference to Acts chapter 14 and verse 27. Acts 14 and verse 27. Paul and Barnabas, when they were reporting to the church what they were doing and the, you know, the ministry and the evangelism that they were doing to the Gentiles, it says, Paul and Barnabas, they reported all that God had done with them and that how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. God, through his apostles, Paul and Barnabas, opened the door of faith, not just to Israel, but also to the Gentiles. So now let's get into the book of Acts again. To this time we're going to look at in chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. We see an example of a Gentile, a non-Israelite. That's what I understand it here to be. Cornelius, a Roman centurion, was in charge of a band of a hundred soldiers. So in Acts chapter 10, this is where... Peter had this dream and he saw this big sheet coming down out of heaven with all kinds of creatures in it, 
clean and unclean animals, you know, like sheep, goats, snakes, rats, all kind of different things. And the voice said to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter's response was, Thank you, Lord. Now I'm free to eat anything I want. <laughs> the kosher laws, the food laws, doesn't apply anymore. Thank you, Jesus. Was that what Peter said? No. Peter said, No, I can't do that. I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. But it was a vision. God was trying to teach Peter something. Because Peter was steeped as an Israelite. Peter was steeped in his prejudices against non-Israelites. Peter was steeped in his prejudices against people who are not of his stock, not of his tribe, not from his clan. But God wanted to teach him a lesson that Christ was bringing salvation to all humanity. Not that everybody would be saved all at once, but Christ was extending salvation to people from all walks of life. And he had to teach Peter this lesson. So in later, the, the, the party went, to, got the Holy Spirit sent this party to Peter and tell him, go and call Peter and tell him to go to, to, to this, um, to this um, Cornelius' house. So let's skip down, we're not going to read all this story, let's skip down to verse 22 of Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10 verse 22 and it says, And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, one who fears God. And that was how often people who are non-Israelites but have accepted the God of Israel, they were often described as God-fearing. God-fearing. They had, they had adopted the God of Israel as their God, and so they were often referred to as God-fearing. So Cornelius, a centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews. So, you know, they, 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 the Jews looked at him and said, yeah, this man is a Roman, he's a centurion, but you know what? He's a God-fearing man. He honors the laws of God, he keeps the laws of God, and he treats the, 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 the people of, of, of God in, in the right way. A just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews. Well, he was divinely instructed by a, by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. So let's, let's skip down a little bit further. We're going to go down to... You can read this in your own time just to get the whole flow of the story. But I'm, I'm just I'm picking up some of the high points here. So let's go down to verse... Uh, let's see verse uh, 28. Then he said to them, this is Peter speaking now, then he said to them, you know how unlawful it is. <laughs> Peter said it was unlawful. Unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So that was basically the interpretation of Peter's vision. God was trying to tell him, don't treat other people. Don't look at non-Israelites and call them common or unclean. Because I have made them. I have purpose for them just as I have purpose for your life. So this was what Peter came to understand. That he should not call any man common or unclean. Let's, uh, I want to focus in on this word, another nation, another nation. The Greek word there is, is Strong's uh, number 246, alophilus, alophilus, and it means a foreigner. You, you can see the word alo means another, and philos, love or tribe. So it's, it means a foreigner, another nation, another tribe. So the Holy Spirit was telling Peter here, you know, he, he had this prejudice against non-Israelites. And he was practicing what the society around him was practicing. I'm a Jew. I will not associate with Gentiles because they are common. They are unclean. They are not the people of God. The Holy Spirit was trying to teach Peter otherwise. God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. As I said before, Peter was steeped in his prejudice. 
You remember in that incident, um, it's reported in, in, in Galatians, Galatians chapter 2, uh, maybe we'll go there, yeah, Galatians chapter 2, when Peter, there are these new converts coming from quote-unquote Gentile background, came in to be called into the church, the first century church. And so there's a mixture of people from Israelite background, Jewish and, and others who are God fearing, God keeping the commandments of God. And then these Gentiles who didn't have that history, coming out of paganism, God called them into the body of Christ. And so they would have their fellowship meals. And so what was happening here is I come into church, you know, we, we come to church, and then after church service, we go over to the hall. This is what was happening. Just to put it in modern day context. We go to the gym, the church hall, for, for, for a fellowship meal. And so because Peter is from Israelite stock, and this other brother is a non-Israelite, what Peter and his colleagues would be doing, they gather over there to this table, sit by themselves. We can sit and eat and talk with these other folks. Yes, they're in the church, but they are non-Israelites. So Peter was showing his, his prejudice. And it took the Apostle Paul, Christ using him, to dispel that myth, myth to set Peter right, to say, Peter, you're a hypocrite. You cannot behave like that. It is ungodly. It is sinful to behave that way, to treat another brother whom Christ has called, who God has given his spirit to. You ought to treat them just as you would treat those other brothers who are from your stock, who are from your tribe, who are from your clan. And so in Galatians chapter 2, Galatians 2 and verse 14, this is what Paul, the rebuke that Paul uh, gave to Peter, said to him, if you being a Jew, if you, Peter, being a Jew, if you live in the manner of Gentiles and not as Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? Because he was being hypocritical. When his friends were around, his Jewish friends were around, he was behaving nice. But when they were not there, he was, he was demonstrating his prejudices towards non-Israelites. And Paul had to correct him. Because you see, this was what was bringing in division within the body of Christ. Fracturing the church. And it had to stop. Paul called it out. He didn't brush it aside. He didn't say because, oh boy, you know, Peter is one of the, Peter is one, one of those three, you know, who is really in Christ, you know, inner circle. I, I can't speak to him. He was wrong, and Paul spared not a moment to correct him, to say, Peter, you are wrong. This is ungodly. This is not right, and it has to stop. Let's continue in here in Acts chapter 10. I'm going to skip down now to verse, um, verse 35. All right, let's, let's take verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. God is not a respecter of persons. It doesn't matter where we come from. It doesn't matter who we are. Once he calls us, he treats us, us all the same as members of the body of Christ. It doesn't matter your beginning. You know, <laughs> And I don't, I'm not going to say it, and I won't call his name, but I have a, a friend here. Sometimes, you know, you'll be talking to him, and he'll be saying, you know, I'm not that learned. I, I, I don't know that much. You are a member of the body of Christ. And it doesn't matter whether you, you, you are not as educated, quote unquote, as somebody else. What matters, what matters is that within each of us whom he has called and we have accepted that calling, within, with the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, that is what makes us one. The Holy Spirit of God in us. And it doesn't matter whether you have a PhD and all I have is a GED. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you went to whatever university of London or wherever 
and I only I didn't go any further than high school. God calls whomever he wants to call. Amen. And when we accept that calling, we immerse ourselves in the waters of baptism. The old man dies and the new man rises. We have hands laid on us and we ask God to impart his spirit. It is that spirit within us that makes us one. And so it, it, it breaks down those, those barriers of our education, of our socioeconomic status, of our race, our ethnicity, of whatever. All of that is put aside. The Spirit of God is bigger than all of that. And we have to come to that place where we recognize that it is the Spirit of God that makes the difference. So verse 34, we just read. Verse 35, but in every nation, in every nation, again the, the word here is, 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 is that same Greek word, ethnos, same word translated Gentiles. In every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. It does not matter where we are coming from. What matters is that he calls, he chooses, and we accept that call. When we accept that call and decide to follow his way, it, it should break down those walls which divide us, those walls from our past. We don't come into the church of God bringing the baggage. We ought to leave the baggage outside, leave it behind us. We are called to a new way of life, to walk in unison with Christ, walk in unison with one another. I may have two dollars more than you, that doesn't make me any better. I may have a little higher education, that doesn't make me any better. I may live on this side of town, it doesn't make me any better than you. We are all one, one in Christ Jesus. And God calls whomever, it says, he calls from every nation, whomever fears God and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. Because he's what? He's Lord of all. Not just Lord of Israel. Not just Lord of the Jews. He is Lord of all. All humanity. Mind you, not everybody accepts him. <laughs> not everybody accepts him as Lord. But whether they accept him or not, that doesn't change the picture. He is still Lord. Lord of Lord. King of Kings. Lord of Lords. The Supreme One. And our response makes no difference. It doesn't change who he is. He's still Lord of all. He's not only the God of Israel, but he's the God of everyone who believes. We jump down to verse 43. Verse 42, and he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and of the dead. And verse 43. To him all the prophets witness that through his name whoever believes, whoever believes, whoever believes, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. It doesn't matter the background doesn't matter where we're coming from if he calls because it is he who calls John 6 verse 44 no one can come to him unless God draws them so anyone whom he decides to draw to call as long as when that person accepts that call and believe and, and, and confesses Lord I believe you I accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ he says it doesn't matter where you're coming from he says when you believe that Salvation is open to you. Remission of sins. And you remember in Acts 2.39, yes, at that time Peter was speaking to a largely Jewish audience or Israelitish audience. Um, and they were Israelites from many different parts. But the principle is this. Is that 
it, wherever you're coming from, when God calls and one accepts that calling, he then becomes the God of, 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 of anyone who, who accepts that call, confesses and believes and, and accepts the sacrifice of, the, of Jesus Christ. Acts 2.39, Acts 2 verse 39, it says, when they asked Peter, men and brethren, what should we do? Verse 38, Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 39, For the promise is to you. It is to you in hearing of my voice, you, you Israelites. The promise is to you to your children and to all last time I look all means all all doesn't mean you know all but ex ex but except for you the promise is to all as many as the Lord our God will call so it is he who does the calling it is his prerogative to choose whomever he wants to call whomever he wants and that promise that covenant relationship then becomes, they become a part of that covenant community. John 3.16, very well-known scripture. For God so loved, what? The world. And the last time I remember, the world actually means the world, which includes Canada, which includes America, which includes South America, Caribbean, Africa, Asia, Europe, Pacific, all those places. All of them. For God so loved the world. And there are people from various different ethnicities, various different backgrounds in all the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever out of all the world who believes in him should not perish but that they should be extended everlasting life having accepted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ I cannot find any way to work around that I cannot do any linguistic gymnastics with that I see it for what it says. And I respect that some people see it differently. I, I'm going to accept that. I, I respect that some people see it differently. My, result, my, my, my reaction or my way of dealing with this is to say, you know what? I completely disagree with others who see it differently. That this world means only a select group of people. I respect each person's right to their opinion and interpretation, though I strongly disagree with it. But at this point what I will say is, there's a word that says that in the book of Philippians about just letting, well, in the, in the Gospels, about letting the wheat and the tears grow together until the day of harvest. There will come a day when we will see clearly, as Paul says. Now we see through a glass darkly. Maybe, maybe I'm not seeing some of these things very clearly. I'm willing to admit that. I'm willing to admit that. It is possible that I'm not seeing everything, all of it clearly. I, I do believe what, 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 I, what, I, what, I, what I understand. And... I, I do believe that the way how some people interpret this, I do believe it's wrong. I do believe it is in, inconsistent with the rest of the scriptures. Because the word says here a little, there a little. That's how we, we, we study this word. We don't just take one part and we zoom into that and we take particular license or whatever and we say this is what it means. and. If it, if it is contradicting with other scriptures, then it, it means that you have to do some other re further re examination. But you know what? For the sake of peace, I'm willing to say, you know what? That's what you believe. That's okay. 
you can hold to that. I will hold to what I see here and what I understand the scriptures to be saying. Romans 8, let's look a bit here at Romans chapter 8, which is also very instructive. Romans 8, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 2, and we'll read from verse 28 into, um, yes, Romans chapter 2, verse 28. Paul was talking about what it is to be a Jew, what it really means to be a Jew. Because there are a lot of people in this world that claim to be Jews, but they are not. They may physically be living in the land of Israel and they may be going through all the rituals, but they are not Jews. I, I, I'm quite convinced about that. And not every, it's just like not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody who claims to be a believer is truly a believer. Because by the fruits it says, you will know them. My sister was praying the other morning and said, God, God doesn't just want us to be a tree. He wants us to be a tree that is bearing fruit. And so it is by the evidence, by their fruit, you will know them. Paul writes in Romans chapter 2, verse 28, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. They can have all the trappings of Judaism. They can wear all the shawl. They can wear all the kapoor or whatever you call it. The headdress and they can say all the words. That's not what makes one a Jew. Are a real Jew. Paul says, For he is not a Jew, is one outwardly, nor is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. That's a tenet of the Jewish faith. Circumcision, physical circumcision. Which is, which is outward in the flesh. Verse 29. Now here's a real Jew. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart. Circumcision of the heart. Circumcision of the heart. In the spirit and not in the letter. Whose praise, and it's a plain word, Judah, means praise. Whose Jewishness is not from men, but is rather from God. That's what makes the difference. That is what makes the difference. Uh, let's go over to the next chapter of Romans, chapter 3, and we'll read uh, verse 29 and 30. Romans chapter 3. Because there are many in the Jewish community at the time, when Paul was writing in the early New Testament church, who was boasting about being Jewish. They saw this as some rite of passage. Rite of passage to salvation. Rite of passage, which somehow made them better than non-Israelites. And so they were boasting about their covenant relationship. They were boasting about that, uh, what, something which was purely physical. By reason of being born into the tribe or into the nation of Israel. And so Paul was cautioning them here uh, in chapter 3 of Romans, uh, verse 29 and 30. Or is it, or, and, uh, it's okay, verse 28. Therefore we conclude that man, a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he, that is, is, is Christ, is he the God of the Jews only? It's a pertinent question. Is he the God of the Jews only? What's the answer? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? I cannot, I cannot in clear conscience come to that position to say he's only the God of the Israelites when this scripture here is telling me. He says not just the God of the Jews or, 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 or the circumcision. He's also the God of the non-Israelite. Yes, of the Gentiles also, since there is one God who will justify the circumcised or the people of that covenant community. There's one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised or the non-Israelite through faith. And then he asks, do we then make the, avoid the law? Of course not. Brethren, 
What we are seeing here in the second chapter, this latter part of the second chapter of Ephesians, is that Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus the Christ, Hamashiach, the Messiah, in Greek, Christos, Jesus the Christos, Jesus the Messiah, he is the barrier breaker. He is also the peacemaker. He breaks the barriers between us. He breaks it down, brethren. And he also brings peace and reconciliation. Peace and reconciliation between, between people who he draws from, from many different backgrounds and different part, pa paths of life. He reconciles them through the shedding of his blood. And he also brings reconciliation between all of us and God, our maker. That's the purpose of his coming. To bring about that reconciliation, to bring peace where there was hostility, where there was war, where there were barriers, where there were restrictions, separating and divisions. Christ came to break down those barriers. Yes, I know. Christ talked about the fact that, yes, by his coming, yes, he will bring division between husband and wife and parents and children. That's a given. But that wasn't his purpose for coming. His purpose was to bring reconciliation. As a result, the natural thing that does happen is that sometimes when we do accept to follow his way, it brings barriers. It brings conflicts between us. And sometimes it's conflict between a husband and a wife because they don't believe the same thing. Sometimes it's conflict between a parent and a child because they don't all believe the same thing. Sometimes it's conflict between parents and children. But let's not take that, brethren. Please, please, please. Let's not take that. Let's not use that to sow, to bring division between ourselves. You know, I remember, I think it was Brother Godfrey who said this to me years ago. You see, we came from a background of this, what used to be the Worldwide Church of God. And we had this prideful thing about us. That because God has called us, and he's, he's not yet called the rest of humanity. And somehow, we comforted ourselves, sitting in our pretty comfortable seat of our calling, that, you know, there's a division between us and anybody who else is not called. And the sad part of that is that, because we said it is God who has to call him, and yes, it is God who calls, we sit idly by and make no effort, make no effort whatsoever to, sh to try to share the truth, to, sh to try to share the blessing of our calling in the hope that God might even be calling others rather than just leave, quote unquote, we just leave them here. You're not called. <laughs> You're not called. <laughs> I am called. <laughs> you know, I can understand why you're behaving like that. You know, you, God hasn't called you. You don't have his spirit. Is that how we should be? Is that how we should live? Or should we be trying to make an effort? And, and I'm, I'm, I'm guilty here, but I'm learning. I'm guilty here, but I'm learning. That as the one who God has called now, it is also my responsibility to reach out to my, my family members, my friends, my co-workers who are quote-unquote not yet called. It is not for me to leave them out there. You're not called. So somehow, you know, your time will come. You'll, you'll have the second resurrection and the second coming of Christ. But I am called now. I have to live my life and leave you alone. You know, this morning as I was thinking, I remember... Pastor Ramakan, who used to be our pastor here, is in England now. And this came to mind. God called him. He was in government, in politics. But God called him out of that life. And he committed his life to Christ. Didn't call the rest of his family at that time when he was called. He could have sat pretty and say, you know, now I am called. Oh, my wife. <laughs> oh, she's... The woman is unconverted. She's not called. Oh, my children, oh, they are not called. But that was not what he did. What he did was he saw it as his responsibility. God has called me now. 
it's now for me to go and see if perchance maybe God is also wanting to call my wife and my children let me go and share this truth with them not put them off in some corner let me go and share this good news with them and that's what he did and as a result his whole family came along God called them it is not for you or I to decide who God is gonna call that's not our prerogative our business is to make sure that we share the gospel we share the truth with those whom with everyone else that we have opportunity to do so and not f sit and just think well you know I am called I am chosen so you will have your time later it's for us to act now yes Christ came to break down that barrier let's get back to Ephesians uh, chapter 2 Ephesians chapter 2 verse 14 verse 12 through 14 it says that at the time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world but now in Christ Jesus you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of blood of Jesus Christ for he himself is our peace he is our peace. He tears down the barrier. He makes peace. He is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of division between us. You know, in the, the, the early days in the temple, when they had the temple, uh, there was a barrier there separating what they call the court of the Gentiles from the places where the Jews had access to. So if you're a Gentile, you couldn't go beyond this barrier. You didn't have access to a certain part of the temple because you're not of Israelite stock. Yes, you know, we, we, we give you a little bligh, so to speak, as, as, as we'd say. You can come in, but you must stay within the court of the Gentiles. Christ came to tear that down. Tear it down so that whether you be Jew or you be Gentile, you have access through Christ into the most holy place. Your background doesn't matter. It doesn't matter one bit. He came to tear that down and to bring reconciliation. Let's read um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 18 to 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 18 to 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 18 to 21 talking about that reconciliation that Christ brings. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ Jesus and has given us the ministry of reconciliation so the fact that we have received that reconciliation, the fact that we have been brought back into this relationship, a relationship that was broken and has been restored by us accepting the sacrifice of Christ, it says that we don't sit there. He has also given us a ministry of reconciliation. It's something for us to do, to seek reconciliation with others. And that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their, their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word or the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. We are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf be reconciled to God for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us why that we might become the righteousness of God in him I ask the question brothers and sisters am I building barriers within the body of Christ or am I attempting to tear down the barriers? Am I building barriers within the body of Christ? Or am I attempting to tear down those barriers through Christ? I hope we ponder that question. Isaiah 59 and verse Isaiah 57 and verse 19 says, I create the fruit of the lips, peace, peace to him who is far off 
that is of the circumcision, of, of the, the uncircumcision, the non-Israelite, and to him who is near, that is the circumcision, the Israelite, says the Lord, and I will heal him. You know, brethren, in the midst of the divisiveness of the times in which we live, the words of Martin Luther King Jr. came to me in that famous I have a dream speech. He said, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. Speaking of the United States, but it's applicable to here too. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners, blacks and whites, will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. And it happened in New Testament times. There were some who were slave owners. But Christ called both the slave and the slave owner to sit together at the same table, the table of brotherhood, brotherhood in Christ Jesus. Dr. King continued, I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream, Dr. King said, that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but rather by the content of their character. Far too often we judge people by the outward appearance. We judge them to be Jews because of how they look. And because some don't look like Jews, dress like Jews, we call them Gentiles and vice versa. I will conclude the message here, brethren. The Word of God gives us, gives us hope, and it gives hope to all believers that through the Holy Spirit, when we accept the sacrifice of the shed blood of Messiah, Jesus the Christ, He will break down those barriers between us, and He will make, taking us from all these different backgrounds, make us into one blessed and united family in Christ Jesus. And that's what we ought to strive for. Tear down those barriers, whether they be barriers of racism, whether they be barriers of genderism, whether they be barriers of socioeconomic status. The blood of Jesus Christ and accepting that breaks down all those barriers. Interestingly, this morning, um, in our prayer meeting, Usually, you know, we start with a, with, a, with a word of scripture. And the scripture I have here as my final scripture is the exact scripture they had uh, in this. It's, it's called BibleGateway.com. And usually they have a verse of the day. And the verse of the day they had was the exact two verses here that I chose to end my message with. I'd already prepared the message and these were the verses I had. And when I saw it, I said, Oh God, this is almost like a confirmation. This is a confirmation to me. And yes, maybe you might be wondering why I was crying when I was praying. I just think of what God has done for us, brethren. I just think of what, what the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, what he has done to call us from all these different backgrounds. When we accept that sacrifice, what it means to us, brethren. And it, would pa it pains my heart if I see any attempt to erect barriers, any attempt to, 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 to divide the body of Christ over issues that it should not be divided over. And so I close with Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 to 29. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 to 29. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. 
And let's understand it. Paul is not saying that Jews don't exist and Greeks don't exist. There's my brother Tom, who is of Greek ancestry. He's Canadian, but he's, he has Greek ancestry. Yes, he says there's neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all what? You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. I rest my case.